little kiddos and their voices, uh, they're welcome in here. Amen? Right? Okay, good. Mark chapter 5. Let me get there. I'm sure you guys are there. And if you guys have any other questions with uh, those announcements, please see me after service or shoot me an email, whatever is best. Well, before we get in, let's pray and uh, we'll get into this word. Father, thank you for your great love for us. God, thank you for your son, Jesus. We gather in your name. You're the King of kings, the Lord of lords. God, you have spoken all things into existence. You have given us your word, God, to who you are and how we're to respond to you and to love you and to love each other, God. So we ask, Lord, that we would see your power and, God, that you would do a great, a great and mighty work in our lives this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I am going to try to teach this as quickly as possible, and if you've been here ever before when I teach, that means an hour. So um, I'm going to try to not do an hour. I'm going to try to shoot for 30 minutes. So throughout this, we usually go expositional teaching, which means we go from verse 1 uh, to the last verse. Um, so I'm going to kind of just describe the narrative, and we're going to take a look at some certain verses here. So Mark chapter 5, if you're there, again, the, the whole thing about Mark is Jesus is a servant. And I, I just have to say right now, this is really nice, preaching to actual people. Been preaching to a camera for the last couple months. So thank you guys for being here. I'm excited about this. Okay. Jesus is a servant. That is the whole narrative of uh, Mark. And so Matthew is Jesus is king. And so we see uh, the you know, it's written to the Jewish people. Luke is written to the Greeks, and it's how Jesus is a man, the God-man, and John is Jesus is God. And so what Mark wanted to do, it's Peter's narrative, and everything's fast-paced. And so you see the word immediately, now, and, then, and it's just like Peter's got major ADD, and he's just like, and then this thing happened, and then this thing happened, and immediately this thing happened. And uh, that's kind of what Mark is. And so it's written to the, the Romans, which actually is a lot like Americans, because we need to be entertained, right? We need, you know, we got major ADD, and um, maybe you don't, I do. And so here in Mark chapter 5, we're taking a look at three different things where Jesus is powerful. He has power over the demonic, over disease, and over death. And so if you're taking notes, those are the three things we're looking at. In Mark chapter 5, let's take a look at verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea of the country of the Gardenes. Now, that phrase, they came to the other side, is one of my favorite phrases. And in fact, uh, if you guys remember from Mark chapter 4, what, what happened? Jesus, um, he gives the parables, and then he says, hey guys, you, let's get into a boat, and we're going to get to the other side. And what happened? This huge storm happened to them. They thought they were going to die. They looked at Jesus like, don't you even care about us? And he like wakes up from his nap. I think it's hilarious that he had a pillow. Like, was Jesus holding the pillow the whole time? Like, teaching everybody? Had his pillow? I don't know. Uh, so he's sleeping on the pillow, wakes up, and he rebukes the storm. And what does it say? They came to the other side. God sought us through, amen? Let's give him some praise. Like, we just faced, I don't know about you guys, I remember the first week when everything happened, I looked at Ashley, I'm like, hey, we may lose the church building, we may lose uh, our house, we may lose our lives, but God is going to see us to the other side. Because the other side, essentially, for the Christian, is heaven, Amen? So if, we, if we've dealt with death, if we know that we are going to heaven, then everything this side of eternity is, is okay, right? God's got it. And so he saw him through the other side, and God saw us through the COVID-19. I know there's still a remnant, and now we have a, another thing that we're dealing with. And we'll always have another thing, because the time uh, that Jesus is coming is near, and so things like this is going to happen. So Jesus saw the other side, amen? Come on. Okay, so I wanted to say that. That's the very important thing. Verse 2, it says, And when he came out of the boat, immediately. That's, thank you. See, that's why it's great to have little ones. Man, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. 
who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone take him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Why did Jesus need to make it to the other side? Why did he say, we're getting to the other side? For this man. For one man. One man that was tormented by demons. Uh, It says a a legion. Now demons are liars, but that could have been upwards of 6,000 demons in this one man. And it says no one can bind him. And so even thinking about this, that sin, it binds us. Satan hates us. Satan is real. And uh, we, when we filmed this uh, for the online service, we filmed it in a graveyard. And uh, uh, all these different things deal with death. You see, Satan hates us. He knows that we're going to die. He wants us to die now. He only came to steal, kill, and destroy. And so he will do that in the most grotesque way or maybe in luring us in a beautiful way. And so I don't want to get too much into this guy and his the evil that he's allowed into his life. But I can say for myself, I've allowed evil in my life. And the only thing that broke the chains of a demonic stuff in my life was Jesus Christ. When I called out to Jesus and I said, Jesus, save me. I didn't need anyone to, you know, do any hocus pocus thing. I just said, Jesus, save me. And I was saved and I was healed and I was set free. And so I believe that Jesus has power over Satan. Amen. Amen. Demons over death. And so here this man is cutting himself. He's yelling. And we see this, um, you know, we've seen this in movies. We see this even in insane asylums. We don't know what to do. We bind them. We literally put them in stray jackets because we don't know what to do. And sometimes we just need to give them Jesus. Now, there's a lot to that as well. But I just say for me, tormented, calling out like this guy and no one, not no religion, no, you know, medicine, no nothing. Only Jesus could set me free. And so we see this, and um, I'm, again, I'm just going to tell you the narrative for, for time's sake. But he comes up to Jesus, and he says, hey, what, are you going to torment me? Uh, because all demons know who Jesus is. Because Jesus created angels, right? And one third of the angels fell with Satan and now they're called demons. And so they know their end, which is going to be hell. You see, hell is real and hell was not created for us. Hell was created for Satan and demons. And so Satan and demons are trying everything, you know, even to distract us right now, to not hear the word of God. We saw that in Mark chapter 4, but also to get everyone's attention of whether it's grotesque or beautiful, to grab them and to take them with themselves to hell. But we call out to to the name of Jesus. Amen. It's how do we get saved? We believe in our heart. We confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died for our sins. He rose from the dead and you shall be what? You shall be saved. And so you do that. He calls out to Jesus, um, and Jesus casts out the demons, and the demons say, hey, will you let us into pigs? And that was the day that pigs could fly. And they jumped off. Ha, ha, yep. Um, They jumped off. (laughs) Shoot. Um, Let's read it. Verse 14. Verse 14. So those who fled, uh, okay, the demons went into the pigs. Jewish people are farming pigs. That's another story. Then the pigs fall into the water. Verse 14. So those who fed the swine fled and told in the city and in the country all. And they went out to see what it would, has happened. I can read. Verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had a legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Okay, uh, verse 15 is wonderful here. It says that they saw what happened to this man, that this man was set free. And it says three things. He was sitting, he was clothed, and he was in his right mind. And I believe that the Holy Spirit puts these kinds of things in the word, in this progression. And I believe this is what happens when Jesus comes inside of our lives and, and saves us and heals us. And it says he's sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. He is resting. He is righteous. He is restored. He is sitting. He is resting. You see, you can't experience the peace of God without the grace of God. And 
And so Jesus comes up and he gives him grace. He casts out the demon. He believes in him now, and now he is resting. See, if you're looking for the peace of God, it only happens at the foot of the cross. It happens as we see Jesus died for our sins, that he is the savior. And so now that we have peace with God, we have that shalom, which means tranquility. So that means that we're not warring with God, that we have peace and rest with God, but we also get that peace, right? Who's had that peace during this storm? Amen? Maybe you have it, and so you want to experience that you need to go to Jesus and rest in his presence. The next thing is not just his rest, but he's clothed. You see, when we believe in Jesus, you know what we look like to the Father? We look like Jesus. We're clothed in righteousness. It says, you know, the word Christian is only used twice in the New Testament, but the phrase in Christ, in him, is used 140 times in the New Testament. And so to describe who we are as a Christian, as we put it, we are in Christ. That means when the Father looks, when he looked at Jesus and he got baptized and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. You know what he says to us? That's my beloved son. That's my beloved daughter. Not because of our own righteousness, amen? It's not because of our own good deeds. It's because of the righteousness of Christ. He clothes us in his righteousness. And so you may be thinking, no, I've sinned too much. Not, you think you sin more than this guy, right? He's allowed 6,000 demons into his life. If he can set free this guy, can he set you free? Can he give you rest? Can he make you righteous? Yes? Yes. And also, he's in his right mind. He is restored. Um, see, I got into all kinds of dark stuff, substance abuse, all kinds of weird stuff. And it turned dark real quick. And um, what I was looking for initially was that peace. You know, as a hippie and stuff, I'm just like, peace, bro, yeah. I'm going to think about my navel in the woods. And, um, but I knew the things that I was doing were unrighteous. And I would say sometimes to my friends, I'm definitely going to hell for this. But there was a time where my mind got so warped and so jacked up that when I walked into a church, it was actually 16 years ago yesterday, June, June 6th, um, I couldn't have a conversation with people. I couldn't read. And you're like, you still can't. I'm like, well, I'm getting better. Um, <laughs> and uh, God has restored me. The, the fact that I'm up here teaching the Bible just blows my mind. The fact that I have a wife and I have a family and have any, like, I just, it blows my mind what God has done. He can restore your life. He has restored your life. Amen. And so that's what he does. He gives us rest. He gives us righteousness. And also he restores our life. Now it's interesting because verse 19, um, oh man, I encourage you. I taught for 70 minutes. In a, in a graveyard. I encourage you to look that up. You know, you can watch it uh, from our app or online or something. Um, but verse 19, I got to skip some stuff. However, Jesus did not permit him, because he asked him to join Jesus' team, uh, but he said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. I love these things in this verse. You see, the demon-possessed guy said, okay, I'm saved, I'm restored, I'm righteous. I want to go on staff at the church. And he's like, not yet, buddy. You know, uh, you know stay here. There's people that need to know. Um, you know, he would have done great. He would have caused a crowd for sure. Um, but he says this, Jesus says, verse 19, go. What did he tell his disciples? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples. That's what he did. He said, go. And where does he tell him to go first? Go home. And like, go home. Why, why don't you tell me to go home? No, go. That see, where does it really count? Our Christianity really counts at home. Amen? That's where it's the hardest. <laughs> uh, is it just me? Okay, it's, it's everybody? Good. Okay, so that's where we start. You see, out of an overflow, especially dads, we're the priests of our home. We carry two positions that God, okay, I'm going to be careful with how I'm going to say this. We're called father and we're called husband. God is father. Jesus is husband. That's a high calling. That's a high calling. And so when our kids see us, it, and again, I got my boys in here, and you know I sin. I got to apologize to you guys a lot. And, um, but I should be a glimpse of the Father 
to you guys. But you should see the Father, right? And so you go to him first. And uh, same thing with my wife. You know, um, we sin. We're sinners. We need grace. But um, the, the first place that we need to do ministry is in our home. Is in our home. Amen? And then it says, go tell your friends. Uh, then tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has shown compassion on you. Can you do that? Can you tell people about the great things that God has done in your life? And can you remind them of the great compassion that he has for them? What's the great compassion? Jesus dying on the cross. And again, we're going to take communion at the end of the service. And just remembering the compassion, the love of God that was shown towards us on the cross. That he, that he was punished for our sins. That he died and he bled and he just said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. His, it says that God loves the world so much that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We want to speak of what God has done and what God did on the cross. Okay, next thing. In verse 21, it says, now when Jesus had crossed over again, so he just went to the other side just for this guy. That was it. Go through the storm, then he left. But I, I don't have time to get into it. Okay, verse 21. Then he crossed the other side, and a great multitude gathered to him. Verse 21. And he was by the sea, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, my little Daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and the great multitude followed and they thronged him. Now here, J.R.S. or Jarius, however you want to say his name, um, comes to Jesus and says, if you lay your hand on, on my daughter, I know that he is going to, or I know that she is going to be healed. Um, but there's nothing worse than seeing your kids sick. You know, like every time my kids get sick, it's just like, how do I, how can I take that upon my own self? And so he's doing everything. And the fact that he's the religious leader of the synagogue, uh, the synagogue and ru rulers, uh, the religious leaders don't like Jesus. So for him to go to Jesus and say, please help, he's ostracizing himself from uh, religion, which is a great thing to do. I encourage you to do that is uh, not to become religious. And he says, please come to my daughter. Here's a desperate dad. Now, this desperate dad and this horrible situation is going to get interrupted by another desperate person. Verse 25. Now, a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years had been suffering many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better. But rather, she grew worse. And she had heard about Jesus. She came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus... Thank you. Knowing in himself that the power had gone out of him, turned around to the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But the disciples said to him, uh, you, Jesus, uh, you see the multitude thronging you? And you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Amen. Jesus has power over demons. Jesus has power over diseases. So just imagine this. This woman is bleeding, and if a woman has uh, any kind of uh, a mission of blood, she can't go and worship. So she is a Jewish woman, and I can just see maybe the way that she's getting around might be crawling. So there's all, she's bleeding, she's sick, and she says, if I can just touch the hem. And uh, the hem of the garment was for generals and kings, and she knew there's a, there's a new man in town. 
There's a new king in town. I've heard of this Jesus. I've heard of what he's done. And if I just touch, by faith, I know I can be healed because he will become my new king, my new general. And all these doctors and all these people, everybody that's trying to help me just made me worse. But Jesus, he can heal me. And I just see her crawling on the ground in the dirt and just barely touching the hem of his garment. And as Jesus said, who touched me? And I was like, um, uh, Jesus, everybody's touching you. Um, but he's like, no, I need to stop everything and recognize the faith of this woman. And not only that, I want this to be recorded. Peter, put this in your head. You know, you're probably the one like, Every, everybody's touching you, Jesus. Um, but take a look at this. It says, verse 34, and he said to her daughter, all right, Daniel really wanted me to say this. <laughs> you know, we identify with certain things that are not true. Uh, we went through the book of Ephesians, and um, during that time, there were some things that were said of me, man, I, was, I, I need to know what's true. Not, not what I believe about myself, not what other people are saying about me, but what, is, what does God say about me? And Ephesians, man, it's just like you're beloved. You are um, you're chosen. You're adopted. You are blessed. You know, and just saying those things in Christ, that's who we are. And so this woman is saying she's sick. She, she'll never be healed. She's always afflicted. And Jesus says, no, your identity is you're my daughter. And that changes everything. Is once we see that we are a child of the king, then our identity completely changes. And so we want to see who we are in God's eyes. But it says, your faith has made you well. It's your faith that heals you. And so the first thing that we need healing from is sin. Amen? Amen? Amen. Right? Because we're all going to die. You see, we can heal every disease. We can feed every hungry uh, tummy. We can, do it. we can do everything. But if someone does not believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then they will spend, no matter how good of a person they are, they will spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And they will be judged for their sins. And this is a real place. This is a real thing. But you know what you have to do? Faith. That's putting trust in God. You see, it's by grace alone that we're saved through faith. That's it. It's not by works, lest we should boast. But then in that, in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, it just paints this picture of like, you're just a nasty sinner. You're so bad. Man, you followed Satan. You're like, I'm not a Satanist. And pay <laughs> uh, Paul's like, yeah, you pretty much were. Um, and then he's like, but God's kindness towards you, his goodness, his richness in love, and you believed in him, and then he changed you. He made you alive, and it wasn't you that saved you. It was Jesus, but now you are his workmanship, and you can walk in good works. And so even like this gal, he says, go in peace. And again, how can we have peace? By grace. Well, the only way to have the peace of God is through the grace of God. And he says, be healed of your affliction. And even thinking about this, there was another woman uh, who was marginalized and taken advantage of. And she was caught in the midst of adultery in the very act. And all the religious leaders dragged her to Jesus and said, okay, Jesus, it's time to throw some stones. Let's do this. And uh, he starts writing something in the ground. And I believe this is John chapter 8. And uh, then he, he says, he starts writing it down. And from the oldest to the youngest, all the religious leaders start leaving. And then he says, who, where are your accusers? And she says, nowhere, Lord. And he said, okay, and neither do I accuse you, but go and sin no more. You see, when we place faith in Jesus Christ as our king, it's no longer we're the king. Right? It's no longer you're the king. Jesus is the king. He sits on the throne of our affections and then we repent. What that means is you're walking in this direction, away from God, and then you turn around and you say, that's my sin. I no longer want that sin. I no longer want to please myself. Instead, I want to go towards Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. And you may stumble, but you're still going this way. Amen? And so that's what we need to do. Just like Jesus said to her, go, you have no more affliction. You have no more sin. Literally, Jesus healed her. And this was what happened to me 16 years ago. Uh, on June 6th, I walked into a church, and I, was, uh, I graduated high school. 
And I partied for a couple days, and I was still kind of messed up. And I told my brother to take me home, and he took me to church. I was like, great, thanks, buddy. And I walked in, and everyone hugged me and stuff. We weren't social distancing at that time. And, um, and then I really heard that Jesus loved me, that he died for all of my sin. And I confessed Jesus as Lord that day. But what I did not anticipate is not only did he heal me of my sin and the penalty of my sin, uh, there were things, I had cirrhosis of the liver uh, from 17 years old, and he healed me of that in a moment. You see, Jesus can save, but also he can heal. And I believe these things, and I believe that he still does that. Even a point, And I didn't ask for it. I just, I just don't want to go to hell. I want to spend eternity with you. I want to live for you, but Jesus healed me as as well. Okay, we got just a couple more minutes. Let's get back to Jairus' daughter. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, don't be afraid, only believe. I mean, imagine those words, hearing from a friend, your daughter is dead. Your, your son is dead. And Jesus overhears, and he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And so, in fact, believe. And I, I, can, I can say that for a lot of things. And uh, some of you guys are new, and so I'm going to tell this one. Um, when we first moved here, planted a church in Boulder, and then uh, a couple months into planting a church, my middle son, Ezra, fell out of a window 20 feet onto concrete. And, um, and Ashley called me and just said, hey, Ezra fell out of a window, come home. And the fire department's here. Click. Like, wait, is, is he alive? Is he, what? And so from Boulder to here, that was a long drive. And a lot of yelling uh, in disbelief. God, how could you do this? this, that, and the other thing. And as I'm turning into my street, just overwhelmed by the peace of God and the kindness of God, and even him speaking to me, these, don't be afraid, just believe. And just thinking, okay, if I come into the house and my son is dead, well, I know I'm gonna meet him in heaven. If my son is broken beyond repair, I know I'm gonna care for him. But God, you can heal him. And he did do that as well. And so, there's a lot to be grateful for. And, uh, Let's, let's skip to the end here. What happens is uh, Jesus follows Jairus to his house, and there's professional criers there, and they are weeping and wailing, and then Jesus says, hey guys, what are you, what's all the crying for? She's just asleep, and they start making fun of Jesus. And I think this is interesting because Jesus takes everybody out of the house because they do not have belief, and he takes them out of the house, and then they ridicule Jesus. Verse 41, let's pick it up there. Then Jesus took the child by the hand and said to her, Telatha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Verse 42, immediately. immediately. You'll catch on next week. The girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and that something should be given to her to eat. Wonderful narrative here in chapter 5. Jesus has power over the demonic. Jesus has power over diseases. And Jesus has power over death. So Jesus takes the little girl by the hand and says, little girl. Now that word is actually little lamb right? Little lamb, come back up. And now this is a teenage girl and says, to you arise. And um, I love hanging out with teenagers. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, there's, you know, especially junior hires, they're like so awkward. Uh, I, got a, I got a teenager in my house, or not, I got a junior hire in my house. You're not a teenager yet. Don't even try to do that. A um, couple years. And uh, one thing I love seeing is teenagers getting saved and living for Jesus and just their passion and their love and they can be used so mightily and so i see this you know jesus is telling teenagers it's time to get up 
because everyone is dead in their sins until they get saved. And then once someone, if the light goes on, Jesus saves them and raises them up. And that's exactly what happens is, it says, I say to you, arise. You see what happens when you say yes to Jesus. Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. I want you to be king. What happens to you? The Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, amen? And you arise, you become spiritually alive and literally immediately she rose and walked. And that's the same thing. You know, young people can walk with Jesus too, amen? You know, junior hires, high schoolers, call, you can walk with Jesus. And so we want to, as parents, let's bring Jesus to our house. Let's bring Jesus to our house. Let's get Jesus to, to awaken our kids. And that's what we need. We need to be desperate dads and moms and grandparents. Come on, somebody. And bring Jesus to our house. Now, last thing that I want to show here, verse 43. But they commanded him strictly that no one should know it. I've always find that interesting, that every time Jesus is like, hey, shh, don't tell anybody. And then they go and tell everybody. And now Jesus is like, hey, go tell everybody. We're like, we should be quiet. Let's not tell anybody. Um, so Jesus said, go tell everybody. Just so you guys know, go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples. That's what Jesus told us. But I want to give her something to eat. This is what we need. You're like, yes, I'm hungry. No, this is what we need. We need the Word of God. Young people need the Word of God. Everybody needs the Word of God. We need to eat this, the Word of God, and feed ourselves and nourish ourselves in the Lord. So if you want to walk with the Lord, awake spiritually from the dead, and become a Christian, then Jesus says, then arise. The same Holy Spirit that raised me from the dead will live inside of you. And now the way that you can walk is yes with your parents, yes with Jesus, but also you get into the Word of God. You start reading, and we have so many things available to us. Uh, not just the written Word of God, but apps and Bible apps and all kinds of different things to encourage us in the faith. So, Jesus is powerful. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, maybe.